Cultural Marxism in America. That's the topic of today's Golden Blonde. And I am your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. Cultural Marxism. What is it? Where is it coming from? And is America in peril of losing America's God-given individual freedoms to cultural Marxism? Scary times for America. Before I get into that, I want to mention that if you like Bold and Blunt, you can subscribe to Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered, but particularly at WashingtonTimes.com or at edify.app backslash podcasts. Edify, it's the place to go if you're looking for faith-based podcasts, so check it out. And I want to give a quick mention also that you can subscribe to my newsletter at WashingtonTimes.com. Go there, find my, my hyperlinked name, click on it, and in the little bio you will see a sign up link for my three times a week newsletter. It comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. In it are all my commentaries that I write all week long at the Washington Times, as well as my twice weekly Tuesdays and Thursdays Bold and Blunt podcasts. If you are already a subscriber, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, not just for supporting me, but for supporting the work of all the fine journalists and writers and investigative reporters and commentary writers and so forth at the Washington Times. So, cultural Marxism in America. Take a look at this poll. Well, take a listen to this poll. I know you can't read it. So take a listen to this poll. It was just conducted by Convention of States Action in partnership with the Trafalgar Group, which, if you're not familiar with this group, but it is one of America's more accurate pollsters, right? So the new survey, it was conducted April 5th through April 8th, over of over 1,000 likely 2022 election voters. So these are the people that count, not just the stay-at-home, live-in-mom's basement type of uh, youth of today that cry about things but don't vote. These are actually likely election voters. And heads up, good news for conservatives. One of the insights is 64% of American voters believe that it's likely Biden, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, is either compromised or conflicted regarding decisions about China due to, get this, his family's business dealings with Chinese companies. By the numbers, let's break it down, 63.7% of voters voters, mind you, believe that it's likely Biden is conflicted slash compromised when dealing with China because of his family's personal business dealings. 52.3% say it's very likely. That's more than half of voters, more than half of likely voters think it's very likely Biden, team Biden, is conflicted on decisions regarding China. 11.4% say somewhat likely. So that's where you get the 63.7%. Only 36.4% think it's unlikely Biden has been compromised by his family's business dealings with China when it comes to making political leadership decisions from the White House. 28.8% of that 36.4% say very unlikely and 7.6% say somewhat unlikely. But here, here's a bigger deal. Here's where the rubber hits the road. And I'm quoting from this, this poll. Large majorities of independents and Republicans believe Biden is compromised in his dealings with China. And more than one-third of Democrats agree. Okay, so take out Republicans. Republicans, of course, think Biden is conflicted when it comes to China making policy decisions on China because of his family's business dealings with China. Okay, take out Republicans. Even Republicans who don't believe that would say in this poll that they believe that because Republicans can't stand Biden, right? But... 
it's the independence that's the huge deal here. The independence, and more than that, in this particular poll, the Democrats, listen to this, 72% of independents believe it's likely Biden is compromised when dealing with China because of his family's personal business. 72% of independents. 85.8% of Republicans believe in believe that, and Here's another significant finding. 34.3% of Democrats think it's likely, likely Biden is compromised on China policy. 72% of independents. Wow. So here's the big thing. China is a country run by communists, right? So it's not just the threat, the political threat of communism that is a peril to America. It's not just the economic threat of doing dealings, of becoming too friendly, of being conflicted when you're in a political position in America, of being conflicted with your dealings with a communist country. It's not just a takeover of the political system of America that you have to worry about. The bigger problem when you become soft and warm and fuzzy and friendly with a communist nation is the idea of that communist ideology weaving into the culture of America. That's the bigger danger because it's one thing for, say, a socialist to win a political office in America, which socialist is just the slow roll toward communism. Socialist slash communist. Very, very one in the same. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez may claim she's a democratic progressive or a progressive socialist or a democratic socialist, what have you, but it's all basically part and parcel of the same bigger umbrella called collectivism. They just move along down that path toward collectivism at various paces. Socialism is the slower, the slower role toward collectivism that communism is, but one and the same. So it's one thing for somebody like an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, socialist slash progressive slash communist, to win an election in America and become a political representative for her constituents in America, which on a quick sidestep, I don't even know how that can be because as a as a politician, as a lawmaker, as a member of Congress, you have to take an oath to swear to defend the Constitution from both enemies foreign and domestic. And I don't know how you can defend the Constitution from enemies when you're that enemy. Communism, socialism, enemies of America. But anyhow, Going back to the original point, it's one thing for a man or woman in America who adheres to socialist communist principles to win an office, a political office in America. You know, you can just elect them out next time. You can boot them. You can give them the boot when they fall on their own uh, failed model of politicking. But it's another thing entirely when the hearts and minds of Americans become drawn toward socialism slash communism. It's another thing entirely when the hearts and minds become captured by socialists and communists. When socialists and communists capture the hearts and minds and and souls of American citizens, where does the hope lie? Because if the voters are swayed into believing that this is how America is supposed to be, then of course the politicians that they elect will represent what they think is the way America is supposed to be. That is a system that you can't just vote them out because when hearts and minds are captured to believe in something, those hearts and minds are going to continue to, at the ballot box, vote for the things they believe in. And in America at one time, it was a given that rugged individualism was the way to go and independence and God-given rights were the characteristics that made up a solid citizenry. It was the mark of an American to be ruggedly independent 
and to turn from things like charity and entitlements and dole outs and to buck a government that wanted to be the paternal presence or maternal presence in individuals lives from cradle to grave. It used to be that those were things that American citizens fought against. But when cultural Marxism seeps into this country and it steals the hearts and minds and souls of American citizens, it comes so slowly and so subtly like a, a snake, right? It just slithers in to the society, into the public consciousness, and it steals the greatness of America. It steals everything that makes American citizens great. The idea that rights come from God, not government. The idea that God instills in each and every one of his creations a certain mission and purpose in life, that it's incumbent on that citizen to then live out to share the talents that God gives each individual at birth. Government steals that, right? Cultural Marxism steals that. Collectivism steals that ideal and puts in place instead that it's the duty of the individual to live for the collective. It's the duty and responsibility of the individual to live for the greater good of government. That it's the responsibility that it's the patriotic duty of individual citizens to actually put forth their talents and stifle their dreams for the greater good of the collective society at large. That's the bigger threat when cultural Marxism is allowed to seep into the soil of America and train the next generation in the proper way to go. And so when we look at this poll, when we look at the compromising of Joe Biden, and if we look at the, conf the conflict that Joe Biden has when he deals with China, you have to look broader than just simply economic policies and things like that. You have to look at the soft and friendly eyes that Americans are now being conditioned to regard China with. You have to listen to Joe Biden's rhetoric and, and watch his actions and see how an open door welcome to China is not just uh, dealing with the devil in the economic world, in the business world. It doesn't just have economic repercussions. It doesn't just water down our own American free market and capitalistic system, but it also trains the next generation. It also trains the existing generations even to believe that, hey, China's changed. China is actually a country that wants a free market system and freedom. And next thing you know, China is going to become the model for America in terms of social structure and cultural pursuits and cultural models and education systems. And if you look at what's happening in America's education system right now, you can see that same sort of socialist slash communist slash Marxist principles weaving into America's political system. It's tearing down the idea that America is exceptional and putting in place the idea that American citizens ought to be ashamed of America. Critical race theory, the 1619 project, that's what those type of teachings are all about. They all, if you look at where they lead, they all lead back to the idea that collectivism is the way to go. Globalism is the way to go. America's sovereignty should be torn down because, hey, America has nothing to be proud about anyhow. So let's look to other countries as the model. Let's look to, say, China. After all, Joe Biden is. Why not America? Why not America's public school system? My guest today, Adam Gillette, he is the president of Accuracy in Media, and his organization has conducted 
an undercover investigation of several of America's public school systems and their findings are shocking. Or maybe not that shocking if you follow how unions have infiltrated America's public school systems and shoved its socialist rot onto public school students everywhere. So maybe it's not that shocking if you follow the news, but it's shocking in that it's so blatant. It's such a blatant violation of law. What accuracy in media found was that even in states where lawmakers have banned the teachings of critical race theory in public school systems, that critical race theory is being taught nonetheless. And if there's one way of ensuring that Marxist type principles stay alive and well in America, then certainly the double whammy of having a president of the United States who's warm and fuzzy on China and having a public school system that feeds cultural Marxist rot, socialism, communism, collectivism into the minds of the nation's emerging leaders, certainly that's the way to do it. Adam, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. So let's talk about critical race theory and this undercover investigation that your organization has conducted. What's going on? Yeah, we've been to over 50 different school districts in the states where critical race theory has been banned by state legislatures. We've gone in with hidden cameras. What we've found consistently is that critical race theory bans do not stop teachers. They do not stop administrators from teaching critical race theory. They accomplish nothing, unfortunately. What's going on here? Why aren't teachers listening to what they're being told to do? Well, what we see again and again from these folks is that they simply come up with other names for it. Now, we didn't expect that they were teaching the higher education version of critical race theory, but rather the tenets of critical race theory. And what happens is you get some administrators who literally have told us we're still teaching critical race theory. We just don't call it critical race theory. Others tell us they had to start calling it social and emotional learning. Others said that uh, that parents caught on to that, so they had to start calling it mental health. We went into states where they literally banned the 1619 Project from being taught. We asked administrators about that, and they say, well, yeah, that's true. We can't teach the 1619 Project, so instead we use a service called Newzella. Well, you look at Newzella online, they're a direct partner of the 1619 Project. So they're simply getting the exact same content into the classrooms just under the guise of Newzella because parents have never heard of it. They're not worried about it like they would be the 1619 Project. Okay, now just to remind folks, what's the big deal? What's the big worry over teaching critical race theory, the 1619 Project, and similar type of ideals and principles to America's emerging leaders? Well, these quote-unquote educators who do a terrible job of teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, now, under the guise of critical race theory, want to teach things like systemic oppression and that capitalism is inherently racist. They want to teach privilege. These are people who can't get kids to read on the appropriate grade level that they should be reading on, and instead they want to teach incredibly nuanced things like racial justice and push these horribly Marxist and oppressive ideas upon our children. It's morally outrageous. We're supposed to believe that these educators exist to provide a public good and to make sure that kids are educated and all they're doing is indoctrinating. Now, what's the honest way of teaching race relations in America, especially at its founding? Because, you know, you can't deny that slavery was on America's soil. So how would you go about teaching that very sensitive topic and applying the principles we learned from that today? Well, gosh, I wouldn't know, and I'm not an educator. And similarly, I would say the politicians aren't educators either. And I kind of agree with these administrators when they bemoan that politicians are teaching or telling them how to teach because the politicians don't really know much about educating. I think they're right. But the solution to that is to have choice in education. If you want your child to learn one version of history, you should be able to send them to a school where they get that. If you want your child to learn a different version of history, that opportunity should be available to you as well. The real solution to these critical race theory issues, whether you like fear to your don't, is school choice. Parents deserve the opportunity to make sure that kids get the education that they want them to get. 
Okay, so I know you mentioned a couple of terms that the the teachers, the administrators are now shoving critical race theory type teachings into the public school systems. But what are some of the other things that parents who are looking for the critical race theory uh, morphings in their school systems, what are some of the phrases, what are some of the descriptions that should trigger them? Sure, it's commonly used or often used in social and emotional learning or diversity, equity, and inclusion. What we see in many of these districts is that they have now full-time equity officers. If your district's got an equity officer, that's a bad sign. And what's really worrying is that you might think this stuff happens in Boulder or it happens in Berkeley. We went to Marion County, Tennessee, a 75%, 25% Trump versus Biden county, incredibly red county. And we had the administrator telling us that their curriculum is extremely progressive from an equity point of view. And my gosh, you know, this is what you're seeing in rural Tennessee. You know, what do you think it's like in the district that you live in? And when you meet with these administrators, they don't come across as evil, one-dimensional, mustache-twirling villains. They come across as well-intentioned uh, people who want what's best for your children. The real problem, of course, is that what you think is best for your child might be dramatically different from what they think is best for your child. That, that's a good point, and that's when you can reveal really the deep-seated socialist-type Marxist intents of these people is when you actually try and oppose uh, such ideologies being pushed through the school system. Yes, they come with the smiles, right? They're so friendly and caring, but when you try to oppose them, that's when you see the real side of some of these school administrators. That's exactly it. You know, these are true believers. You know, they believe they're doing God's work if they believe in God by, you know, finding ways around the law to push these ideas no matter what. And that's what they're going to do. And I'm telling you, these schools are so much like Congress. Congress as a whole, the popularity rating of Congress is terrible, right? But everybody thinks their congressman's the good one. After all, they voted for him and they're not an idiot. Schools are the same way. We all recognize that public education is a mess, and we, but we've met with our teachers, we've met with our administrators, we assume they're the good ones. Well, I met with your administrators too, and I did it with a hidden camera, and what I found out is that overwhelmingly, they're radical progressives who ignore the law to push their Marxist ideas. And briefly, just talk about the differences between equity versus equality, because those are catchwords that I think slip by unaware, even in politically savvy conservative Americans. That's exactly right. Now, equality is what we all wanted. We should all be treated equally by the law. Well, equality is no longer in vogue amongst these radical progressives. They only want equity. And they view equity as, instead of giving us all the same treatment, giving us appropriate treatment that puts us all on the same level. That sounds swell, it sounds reasonable, we can have a discussion about that, but who's to determine who needs to be on what level and what needs to be done to get them there? Well, naturally, with government, it's always the politicians and the bureaucrats who are going to determine who gets what. It's simply a way to empower politicians to pick winners and losers in life, just as they currently often pick winners and losers in the marketplace to give some people special treatment as a protected, protected class and to make sure that you know speech is blocked from other people. It, it's simply a way to empower politicians to run our lives. Yeah, that, that's, that's the big question, right? And that's what people should be asking when they hear these terms. Who decides? And look, I'm all for equity if I'm the one that's allowed to decide for everybody, right? And, and I'm sure government officials feel that they're best equipped to decide for the rest of the peon class, the parents, and so forth. But that's just not the case. Yeah, that's exactly it. And they're government officials. They think they're best equipped to decide everything. You know, they want power entirely concentrated in them because they've got the best intentions, the most information, the most knowledge. That's how these people view things. You know, again, they're not one-dimensional villains. They probably mean well, but the end result of what politicians intend, the end result of what well that they mean doesn't end up well for most of us. Now, you mentioned Tennessee, rural Tennessee, where you would expect it to be conservative in the school system, same as it was conservative in the, in the constituency of that, of that area. What other states, what other jurisdictions uh, surprised you? Well, we released an investigation from Idaho as well, another state that banned critical race theory, another incredibly red state. And what we saw again and again and again, they literally just changed the name as they tell us. They bragged to us. 
about the tactics they use to teach uh, to keep teaching critical race theory, even though it's illegal. We have another investigation coming out this week from another state that banned critical race theory that I really look forward to sharing. It'll be on our website, aim.org, and on all of our social media channels. But what seems to be the only solution to this problem is school choice. Do you favor proposals such that are, are sort of making the media rounds now where the money follows the child, where the money follows the student? So basically, however much money is allotted from the federal and state government to provide a public education for your child, you can take that money and put it elsewhere and bring your child into a different school system. Do you see long term that being good for America's education system and for America's youth? Absolutely. As Corey DeAngelis brilliantly always says, we should be funding students, not systems. The goal of public education shouldn't be to support the education system. The goal of public education to be to educate kids. Instead, I think we have a public education system that if outside observers came and, came and looked at it, they would think that public education simply exists to take tax dollars and give it to progressive candidates. Because that's the only thing that publication does, that public education does consistently well. Kids may or may not learn, but every two weeks without fail, the teachers get paid. Every paycheck without fail, a portion gets taken out, given to the unions. Every two years without fail, that money goes to progressive candidates. The NEA and the AFT donate more money than the Cokes, more money than George Soros. They're the biggest donors in American politics. We have an education system that essentially exists to embezzle tax dollars and give it to candidates. I, I would rather an education system actually focused on educating kids. You know, I kind of think some Republicans have dropped the ball in recent times about that whole messaging about abolishing the Federal Department of Education and breaking up the unions and so forth. It just seems like there's a lot of talk, such as we're engaging in right now, about the problems of funding and, and the unions and the, and the federal overreach into school systems. But little gets done, little gets changed. Where do you see that? Do you see America's education system return? turning to the once fine, prestigious uh, characteristics that marked it? Well, it depends if politicians will have the courage of their convictions and actually go out and advance school choice. Because there's no reason that our K-12 system can't be as good as our higher education system. You know, the difference, of course, in the two being choice. You know, your college isn't picked for you solely based on where you live. You can actually take your money and go to whatever college you want to varying degrees. Um, the biggest obstacle to that, believe it or not, is actually rural Republicans, because the biggest employer in many of their districts would be public education. So, again, you know, as I said, the goal of public education should be to educate children. But for these rural Republicans, they think, well, it's, it's to keep people employed in my district. And they end up voting against doctors. They end up voting against charter schools. They vote against education savings accounts. And this is where it's incumbent upon people to speak out against their elected officials, regardless of party, and demand choice in education. Adam, that's a great investigation. And accuracy in media, I've been a big fan of the organization for years now. Tell people your website and promote whatever other work you have coming up once again. Sure. Of course, it's aim.org, aim.org. We do investigative journalism to expose public corruption. And we also do social activism, where we take political tactics and use them against cultural social targets and put frowns on the faces of bad people. Awesome. Investigative journalism. Remember that? <laughs> Remember those days when journalists actually did that? It's great to know yeah. that you guys are out there doing that. Adam, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so very much. Just one more reason to do away with public school teachers unions, yes? Or how about that old principle that Republicans used to fight for in America, disbanding the Federal Department of Education and, oh, look at this, letting parents have control over their kids' education. What an idea, what a concept. Well, we've come a long way from those days in America, but at the very least, we can get teachers to do what they're paid to do. And more than that, with critical race theory, do what they're paid to not do. Enough of the CRT, enough of the 1619 lies, 1619 project lies. Enough of teaching our kids to hate America. How about we get back to the old concept that it's a given, it's the premise 
of all teaching in public schools that America's the best dang country in the world. And it always has been. How about we start with teaching that? and bringing it back to a time in America where that's the given. And even Democrats, even Democrats could grab a hold of that and embrace it. How about a return to those days? Well, I think we've strayed too far, but there's always hope. There's always hope when you have hope in God, right? And after all, this is a nation that was built on faith in a creator. So in that respect, there's always hope. There's always hope even for the lost Democrat sheep. If you like Bold and Blunt, please subscribe to Bold and Blunt. Go to anywhere podcasts are offered, subscribe, or go to WashingtonTimes.com, subscribe there, or go to edify, edify.app backslash podcasts, the online platform for all your faith-based podcasts. You can find Bold and Blunt there. And heads up, I have a new book coming out May 3rd. It's right around the corner. Pre-order now, please. If you're interested in knowing all the various ways the left did use and continues to use and will continue to use the coronavirus for political exploitation to steal American liberties. It all starts with being educated and aware of how the enemy works. And then you can effectively fight. It's called Lockdown, the socialist plan to take away your freedom. And honestly, it's more than one plan. Check it out, pre-order now. Arm yourself with the truth. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time. And in the meanwhile, stay blunt, stay bold, 